Okay, ready? Ready. <sighs> okay. <clears throat> what is that? Uh, God. Can't even talk. How's it going, everybody? This is Joe Adams, and welcome to the Relentless Pursuit Podcast. What we do on this podcast is bring in guests from all different backgrounds, all different walks of life to share their stories and take us through their journeys and everything in between. We're here to connect. We're here to make an impact. And that's what we do and find relation with everybody that comes in here. I don't even know. I got y'all both here, so I'm like, I'm not used to recording with two people. <laughs> so I'm like tripping this up. That's why you get to edit. That's why I get to edit. No, I'll just leave it in because I don't care. You know, <laughs> people are just like, yeah. It he, sounded fine to me. Yeah, you're human. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, you know what this is all about. If that is for you, check it out. Like, subscribe, all the things. If that is not for you, I don't know what your problem is, but you need to jump on board. There you go. But... Without further ado, I would love to introduce two guests today, Rick and Kelly Cheatham. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for having us. I got to have the build up. <laughs> so thank you for being here, guys. I'm Rick for the third time and Kelly for the first time. It's good to have you guys. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Honored to have you both. You know, um, real quick backstory. So if y'all don't know Rick's story... Check it out, episode 103 and 104. A lot going on there in that in that time frame. Um, you know, a whole lifetime of just craziness and beautiful, you know, change and all this different stuff tied into about three hours of content. Um, and, you know, that is, it just blew my mind, every bit of it. And so definitely check that out because it leads into this one. Because now we have his wonderful wife, Kelly, here to share her journey, but also her perspective of things. And so I'm really excited about having you guys here. It means a lot. It Thank means you. a lot to We're have excited. you. Yeah, yeah. It's I mean, an honor. I mean, y'all's story has inspired the hell out of me. I know that. It, it, it got me pretty emotional for a couple of weeks. Because, you know, <laughs> I'm editing. I was telling him I got to edit it and, like, re-listen and, like, constantly, like, view it and i feel it you know what i'm saying so it's been it had a massive impact so Good. you know if y'all impacted anybody y'all impacted me so Aww. there's there's one person so i appreciate that yeah yeah <laughs> and i think there's a lot to be said about you your your relationship and y'all's growth y'all have had in your marriage because uh you know marriage is a tough thing it's very. not easy i mean very you know yeah you, you Hell, I think, you know, starting a business and having a baby all at once, for me, on my side, like, Lydia and I probably, I mean, a lot of relationships wouldn't make it through that. Just starting a business alone. Um, right. You know, and um, I'm very proud of us because we've just gotten stronger and we've got a wonderful relationship and I'm grateful for her. But, so I think I feel like we could share some wisdom from our end, but we're a lot younger. Y'all been through a hell of a lot more than we have in, in y'all's time. So I'm excited to... Break that down and right hear on. what you got to say, Kelly. Right and, on. you know, obviously Rick chiming in too. So <laughs> this is more about, this is Kelly's story today. So this is y'all's story. But, uh, yeah, no, it means a lot to have you guys. And uh, I got to shout out to Rick because Rick, you know, if, like I said, if you checked out his episodes, uh, Rick was paralyzed from the chest down. And now Rick's training with me He's a, as my client. He's yes. in the weight. He's hitting the Yay. weights, and he's getting stronger. And it's uh, it's a beautiful thing to see and be a part of that journey. Yeah, so shout took, out to you, man, for that. Took three years to get there, but yeah, a little over three years. But man, I tell you, I was just telling Kelly the other day. I said, I feel so much different. I'm using muscles I didn't even know I had. Yeah, it's really cool, man. <laughs> I mean, you know, the fact that you're willing to do it. You know, you, you could easily just be like, ah, I'm not going to hit hit any weights, but you're like, yeah. no, I could, still so capable. Yeah, and that's amazing. So yeah. shout out to you for that, but. Kelly, we want the audience to get to know you a little bit. You know, know your story. We've uh, Rick went pretty in depth. He's an open book, and I love that. So, take us back to your history. You know, take us, take us. Well, first of all, tell us what it is that you currently do in your life, and then and then we'll take it back. I'm a registered nurse. Okay. I currently work in case management. Um, I wanted to be out of the hospital. A lot of hard work yeah. for our nurses out there uh, that work the floors. I really feel for them. Yeah. 
So um, now I'm, I'm out of the hospital, but I still work with patients just doing case management. How long have you been, you know, nursing? Uh, I believe it's been about 16 years. 16 years? I was a late starter. Oh, really? Yeah, I didn't uh, start nursing. Well, I, I went to school. I started school when my kids started kindergarten. Okay. And so I just took a class at a time while yeah. they were at school and took me 12 years to finish. <laughs> that's awesome, though. I mean, that's yeah. persistence. That's persistence. Yeah. So it was, it was Relentless. Just, uh, yeah. Yeah. It was, it was tough, you know, because I still wanted to be, you know, home for my boys and uh, do room mom stuff and pick them up from school. So one class at a time. You know, it's uh, in a way I can relate, right? Like doing, you know, I, we got a, a newborn pretty much. <laughs> She's one year old, so it's a little different. We don't, we're not dropping her off at school. She's with Lydia most of the time. But uh, still parenting and, mm-hmm. you know, it, with me like running a business, like, and trying to do school is a lot. It takes yeah. a lot of bandwidth. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, when yeah. do you study? you got to figure that out. Yeah. And, uh, and being parents and uh, going to school is no joke. No I mean, joke. Parenting is hard mm-hmm. anyways. And then when you're studying sciences, yeah. it was tough. Yeah, yeah. It was tough. I got overly ambitious. I was like, let's do 12 credit hours at a time. And last semester, I, <laughs> I was, was like, like oh. <laughs> I know what my, I'm beyond my max. So n- let's get this done. And then we'll step it back a little bit. So, yeah, yeah I've, I've had to cut back. And just, it's, 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 one, it's one of those things now I look at it. It's like, well, my priority is my family and my business. The schooling is a side quest. That's how I look at it. It's just a side quest. It's going to get done when it gets done, but I know what my I need to focus most of the time and energy into. So, but you stuck with it, and here you are. Yeah, you've yeah. been saving lives. I don't know. You probably saved some lives and saved all kinds. mine. Saved your. I mean, you definitely saved yeah. mine. She did. I she am, did. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Twice. Hell yeah. I mean, hell, my wife's not even a nurse. She saved mine to a degree. <laughs> so <laughs> I mean, and in, in, in a lot of ways, actually. But that's women that's, tend to be nurturing and and heart just. But naturally, yeah, they tend to be nurses. So yeah, I love that. So well, I think that's uh, that's pretty awesome. I mean, it's it's cool to know. So you're doing that now. Now let's talk about what led you to today. So take us back to the early days. You know, where are you from? Um, you know, a little bit through your childhood. Anything you want to touch on through there, and then up until, you know, meeting Rick and walking into the church and being his prayer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was uh, born in Long Beach, California. Okay. Um, my dad was in the military, he okay. was in the Navy. Uh, my mom worked at Rockwell International. Um, so I basically grew up in a city, very nice to grow up in. You know, you can yeah. walk around, there was no problem. Um, but uh, my dad was an alcoholic. Uh. And so we grew up with alcoholism, a lot of uh, trauma. Um, a lot of times we we're out of the house because dad would come home, you know, drunk and it wasn't a safe environment. So it wasn't conducive to studying. Yeah. So growing up in elementary and junior high and high school, it was very difficult to focus with school. So I, I wasn't a good student, Yeah. but looking back, I understand why. Yeah. You know, as a nurse, you look back at all the things that happen to people and you can see why things don't work out the way they did that stem from was he in the military like while you were during your childhood mm-hmm. or, okay yes. so it probably stemmed a lot yeah. from that well he he also grew up in an alcoholic family ah. so there's a lot of family history from that and my parents my mom also from an alcoholic family so when they got married they left uh texas and came to california you know to leave the environment but you know the environment brought them you know still was there yeah I felt unlearned things. It's interesting because, you know, I was in the military for uh, six years and, you know, 19 getting stationed in Panama City Beach, Florida. Like, <laughs> what do you do? You party. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like uh, you're an adult and now you get the, you got all the bars right up the road and you joke about it. Like, yeah, it's just part of it. Right. Part of the lifestyle. You know, you drink and you do these things. I mean, you work all the time and you get a paycheck and you hang out with the boys, you yeah. know. And um, I think when you're that age, you know, you're younger like that. Like, that's normal mm-hmm. activity, right? Um, but you do see it take effect and be, like, pretty big habit in people's lives later on in their careers. Not yeah. saying for everybody, but a lot, you know, it sticks with them. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it can be that way. So it's pretty unfortunate because I think I dated a girl when I was that age, and um, she had a big problem with it. But her dad was an alcoholic. And I'm like, 
I'm just a military guy. You know, this is what I'm stationed. Right. What do you but she had a big problem? I'm like, listen, I'm just having fun. I didn't think I had an issue. I probably drank yeah, I did drink quite a bit, but you know, that just was a phase. But yeah, like you said, it's obviously stuck with him, so that's unfortunate. Yeah. Um, what's your relationship with like with him now or well, he passed away oh, about okay. twenty some odd years ago. Mm. Um, but we had rectified our relationship prior to that. Um I do wish he was around now, especially being at the age that I am, to ask him questions yeah. as to why, you know, what happened, you know, what were the things. I know that he lost a brother at a young age, um, and he was a part of that. His brother had drowned. Mm. Um, I know that his dad died also as an alcoholic. He um, had a car accident. Yeah. And so he was very young yeah. when he lost his dad, and dads are important in the home. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, those are things that I wish that, you know, he was around that I could ask him. You know, I, I love my dad. Yeah. Um, he was very respectful to me. Um, he, you know, when you hear of alcoholism and all the stories that go along with it, um, as long as he wasn't drinking, Yeah. if he was drinking, it was scary. Yeah. There was a lot of screaming, you know, a lot of hollering and just things flying and it just was not a healthy home and the, yeah and that's that's no good yeah it sucks i mean you know typically those those issues do stem from drowning something out that you want exactly. to get rid of yeah. you know i mean yeah. exactly you, shoot lydia and i when we first started dating we would um you know we were in that like best friend i mean she's still my best friend but just getting to know each other so we drank a lot of wine you know, tons of wine. Like, through the week, we just get a bottle and just be like, yeah, and you just be sitting on the couch talking. The truth sayer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But we just have so much fun with it. And then, like, you know, we had Oz, and it's just kind of phased out. And it's not that we don't, like, like drinking, but we just, it serves no purpose, mm -hmm. you know, because we are best friends still, and we've built that relationship. But we just, we, we'll drink every once in a while, but that's about it. And we don't get too crazy. I mean, yeah, it's one of those things that phased out, right? But I noticed, like, as a grown away from it you know a lot of that heavy stuff comes from just not dealing with this right you know exactly i mean that's yeah. why i was i told you you know i was addicted to pills when i was you know first time i went to college but it's i just wanted to tune things out that was yeah. the, it was easy to do it with that so just kind of blow it off but but i'm glad y'all were able to rectify things and at least come to that before you know yeah. you know I, before I he passed and he ended up dying of alcoholism yeah. So he just, he never could stop. You yeah. know? And, and he did, he just apologized over and over. and was like, dad, there's no need for you to apologize. Like, I understand. You know, yeah. it, it, was, it was hard. Yeah. And I do miss him. Yeah. Um, my mom is uh, still living. She lives in California. Okay. And I do talk to her. You know, um, our, our relationship is uh, different. Mm -hmm. um, just because where I am uh, in my life, I love my mom. Um, she survived a lot to yeah. get us where we are because uh we we didn't drink we didn't do drugs you know school was important yeah um, and when i went to nursing school you know she took care of my kids you know while i went to school because that of was course. important so um she's always been very supportive mm -hmm. of me and my life that's good so i do appreciate her i think uh, you know a lot of the, probably as other those other issues probably had a pretty big effect on her too, you know. Absolutely. Right. Fortunately, I saw it with my grandparents. You know, my Absolutely. grandma had dementia, and mm -hmm. you know, but her—I mean, her life was pretty. She went through some tough shit, you yeah. know. You hear my mom's story; it's like, oh my god. Yeah. You know, but seeing what my grandma went through, you know, it yeah. takes a toll on people. Yeah, you have no idea what goes on in a home like that, you know, and it's not because they want to be that way, you know. You know, they talk about uh, the codependent aspect of it you know yeah. they're they feed off each other and there's a lot of stuff that goes into it yeah it. um you are a survivor exactly when you come out of that yeah and a lot of people talk about you know just moving on from i've moved on from this and it's like yeah but have you worked on it right mm. there's a huge difference and i like the, you know for lack of better words i use it the boomer mentality it's like ah oh, therapies for crazy people and this and that and i'm like no they're like this stuff has power like yes. you can sit there and brush all the past situations under the rug all you want it's not going to help you no. it's going to rise up at some point it does. you know that someone's gonna something's gonna lift that rug up and yes. it's all gonna come flying out yes. 
And so uh, I think that's a huge emphasis and something very important nowadays, um, you know, that's, I think I see more of an uprising is actually communicating these things and working on them, confronting them, not just being like, I've worked on it. Yeah, it's good. It's in the past. Like, but it's, you're still holding on to it pretty heavily, you know, and like growing from those things and being like, oh, they are there, but like I can gain power from that. Right. You know, so that, um, so I guess bridging from there, bridging into, I mean, so you went to school. We were both brought up in the same uh, religion. Mm-hmm. Okay. But I never knew him. I never knew Rick. I never met him until I was, uh, well, six months before we were married. How um, old were you? Y- y'all were pretty young, right? Yeah, we, I had just turned 20 when I met Rick. Okay. Um, I do preface this. It was funny because my kids always laugh at me. But when I was 10 years old with all this drama and everything i just i prayed for a man that went to church yeah and loved to talk <laughs> uh loved to stay after church and, and that's the part that my kids always teased us about but um so at 10 years old i had my vision of who i wanted nice and so um we were i was dating this one particular guy who happened to not be very nice, he was uh, cheating on me. And it was his cousin that said, I have the perfect guy for you. And I was like, mm, and I'm not sure about that. And she said, just come, you know, to services. Your, she tr- said, your family I'm, members tend to be, yeah, yeah, like, uh, I see the track record. No, I'm just kidding. Well, it was his cousin. Okay, was okay, okay. Oh, yeah. was even so. more <laughs> strange. Yeah. <laughs> um, and she said, you know, just come to services and just meet him. Yeah. You know, just, and I, okay. So my best friend and I went to church and um, saw him. He was getting ready to do song leading. So I knew he was a leader in the church, okay. you know, because, you know, you don't usually get up there if you're shy. Yeah. You know, you're, you're a participant. Um, and he's just, he's very likable. I mean, everybody, he's had the biggest smile on his face and just drawn, people just drawn to him. And I like that. Yeah. I, I really did like that. That's um, cool. And he, he had, had a presence to him. Yes. Yeah. An absolutely fabulous smile. Yeah. That's, I think, what got me was his smile. Rick's got a good smile. You got a good smile, man. Yeah. Good teeth. Yeah. <laughs> she was checking my teeth out. Yeah, that's, that's what it was. She was like a horse. Over. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kind of life this guy got. Yeah, I get that. <laughs> so we just started dating. Our, our first date, we went to a Japanese restaurant, which I found out years later, he didn't even like Japanese food. <laughs> That's but funny. ate all of it. I'll do it for her. You do it for her, right? <laughs> yeah. I guess I'll do this. <laughs> uh, the second night, I was headed to Magic Mountain to see Loretta Lynn. Okay. And he wanted to come. He, he never really would even listen to country music. Mm. And so he was a rock and roll guy. And so we went to uh, Magic Mountain and saw Loretta. And he was jumping up and down. He had so much excitement over Loretta Lynn. And he was <laughs> like, this is awesome. You know? That's funny. <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty cool. It makes me think uh, opposite um, with Lydia and I, you know, I listen to like black metal, you know, and like, so her first concert ever with me was at a black metal show in in Nashville at the Exit Inn, real small venue. And it's just like, like just chaos. And she's, she's there. But you know, it's, it's when you, when you're falling for somebody, you just want to experience them. Yeah. You know, you don't want their interests. It doesn't matter if they're just like you, you just want to experience life together and right. like, the things that make them happy, and that's cool. Mm-hmm. And that's what he did. He ate the Japanese. And then hey, like, hey. I, just so that you know, I love Japanese food now. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it grew I, on you. Getting getting used to eating raw fish and that kind of stuff was a little challenging, but now I like it more than she does. Mm-hmm. Oh, man. I can eat sushi all day long. I can long. eat sushi all day long. I, yeah, can, I, I, I really can. can. It's, for it. <laughs> there's a really good, just so you know, in Murfreesboro, I'll, I'll find the name out, but there's an all-you-can-eat place, like lunch, Really? And it's like 20 bucks or something like that. And yeah, it's 20, 20 something bucks, but it's all you can eat. And they like bring it to you. It's not like a. Wow. Like a fast food. Yeah, no, it's 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 really good. My buddy and I went there and I was like, dude, this is like really good. I'll show I got took a picture. I was like, I was impressed. I'll let y'all know. (laughs) (laughs) We'll we'll be sure not to forget that. But um, anyways, yeah, I mean, you know, you just adjust, but that's pretty cool. Um, From that time on, we were inseparable. Yeah. So we spent all of our time together. 
um, I ended up moving out to an apartment with a friend of mine uh, from church. Um, I, I don't even think we lived there very long um, before we were married. Rick had proposed, and we were married within six months. Yeah. So it never even dawned on me because I I'm Hispanic, mm-hmm. and so I was going to ask you yeah, what your heritage was. Yeah, so we're completely different cultures. Yeah, totally different. Both of my parents are Hispanic. You know, and Rick he always says he's hind fifty seven, but um, just completely different way of thinking and growing up. So that was a huge mm. challenge in in our first part of our marriage. Yeah, it is it is different. Mm-hmm. Like I've tried to I try I think I I talked to like a Venezuelan girl at one point years ago and like just culturally it was such a mm-hmm. so different. And like I'm yeah. so ingrained in who I am. So I was just like, man, this is it was hard to like connect, you know, to be yeah. honest. And you know, she lived like kind of far, so I was like, it just didn't work out. But yeah. you know, yeah, that's yeah. that's definitely a hurdle. The cultural differences are big. So when you talk about growing up with um, an addict, and even though I didn't drink, I didn't smoke, um, one of the things that I did carry over was anger. Mm. And so that was very volatile in the early part of our marriage. So losing my temper was very hard. Mm. And um, he wasn't used to things, especially women. Yeah. You know, blowing up like that and he was like what am i gonna do with this and i was just like, <laughs> like well you just married to this so let's get this going <laughs> i don't recall my mom ever saying that to my dad <laughs> hmm. that's funny that's a new one i'm gonna have to get used to this <laughs> Rick's just like she, dude, my bad. <laughs> she wasn't answered prayer so i figured okay well, it must be part of the package yeah yeah i mean y'all were... I needed that i needed a. I needed somebody that wouldn't take my crap yeah, for sure. And and would hold me accountable. And if it meant losing your temper because of the frustration, then so be it. Yeah. You know? Clear your throat. Yeah. You know, for lack of better terms. I mean, just say what you gotta say. At least at least it's better than not approaching it. You know right. what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I mean, over time you've obviously you probably learned how to just Yeah, <laughs> let, definitely mellow because it, it out. just didn't work. You know, yeah. and that's where, you know, Rick talks about you know, I know he gives me a lot of credit in this marriage, but he also shined the light on my own mm. um, areas that I needed to work on coming from an alcoholic home. Yeah. And um, he also had the patience and the tenacity to figure it out. Yeah. You know, that he wasn't just going to let me go. I'm thankful that in our highs and lows, um, one was willing to give up and the other one wasn't. Yeah. You know, and vice versa. So it, mm. we just balanced each other out. There was rarely a time, rarely, that I think we were on the same page. We're done. Because I think we probably could have just yeah. called it off. Yeah. Especially given some, you know, circumstances, which, right. we're, which we're getting to. And um, I was thinking about you saying what you were saying. You know, one thing I faced in race, past relationships was, I don't know what it is, but people want to change the person they're with, right? And it's like you don't need to change the individual, change habits and, you know, things that are toxic, you know, you you should help them want to improve. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I was, uh, for me, it was always like, I just don't want someone to try to change me. And I always ran into that, like someone wanting to change me, whether it be just who I am or the music I listen to, all these things that are part of me that I I Mm -hmm. love. And, um, but like, yeah, it made me want to be better. And so Lydia came into my life and like, she just makes me want to be the best I can, but she loves everything about me. And I'm like, oh, she doesn't want to change me at all. And that's the, that's kind of the point, right? You don't go right. into a relationship trying to change who someone is because you can't, you got those ingrained qualities that are like yeah. what make them unique and special, mm-hmm. but exactly. like improve the negative things, mm-hmm. you know, that, that can be detrimental. So, and it seems like y'all have done that for each other. So it's great. Um, he definitely, um, he was a very strong man and I needed that. I, I dated a lot of guys that I could push around and that's not something he was very strong that he could lead me in a different direction. Yeah. You know? And so I appreciated that. Yeah. And and he did love to talk. So I love that. (laughs) He's a very people person. Yeah. You know, all those things, all the attributes, I loved where they were. Exactly. The only thing I didn't like. Was the cheating? Mm. 
that was something that had yeah. to change. So you couldn't do the cheating, which is un- understandable. I don't yeah. think anybody should be okay with yeah, that. I don't think I'm so. not into sharing. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, that's unfortunate. Sharing caring, but that's, that's where I draw the line. <laughs> it, oddly, it's a, it's a normal thing these days. Um, I definitely speak out against that, but I'm always yeah. very traditional in that sense. My, 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 my wife and I are, but like, it's weird. Yeah, it seems to be a common thing in a lot of with a lot of people and we're just like what the world that's so it's such a yeah. weird concept and and not and judging if that's your thing i mean but that's correct. i don't stand correct. by it <laughs> yeah that the cheating that 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 i was dealing with it it also stemmed back from you know childhood trauma and how i was anesthetizing all of the uh, the trauma that i sustained and I used sex as a way of anesthetizing that pain. Yeah. Like some people would use alcohol, drugs, uh, fooding, food, uh, gambling, shopping. shopping, you can name it. I mean, like we talked, uh, addiction can be anything. It doesn't have to be a drug. It just, it's what gives you a dopamine rush. So you can make anything an addiction. One, well, uh, like pornography is preached and to be such a normalized thing. It's like, very, oh, it's okay. Yeah. Just, you yeah, just watch guys porn. Just guys. Yeah, just do, so, and you hear that from a very young age. Right. I mean, you know, even more so now. Mm-hmm. And it's so, like we were talked about, it's so readily available now. It's scary. And, um, and it's, it's so, such a wide variety of things going on. And so it, it's ingrained in us to be like, okay with it. When in, in all reality, it's actually one of the most, I think, one of the most evil things. Very isolating. Yeah. Um, it, it it just prevents you from having an emotional and spiritual relationship right. with your partner. Yeah. That's exactly right. It just right. really, pre- it, it's that roadblock. It is. And it, and it, I think it, um, you know, unfortunately, it's like going through that. You know, I, I've been there before, too, at a younger age. And um, I think it's kind of got to show com- some compassion towards towards guys going mm-hmm. going through it because it is introduced to us at such a young age and ingrained to be normalized and it's like it's hard to break away from that unfortunately i mean a lot of people look at it but like it's normal but you know i excuse me for this but i uh i was on jeff's podcast and we talked about pornography and i was like well i i was like if you watch porn you're a cuck and he was like what do you mean by that i said well take think about it you're looking at another guy you're you're getting off to another male doing somebody you want to be with like you're you're observing that and you're getting off to it i mean i was like that's that's the term of that there's a cuck and he was like dude you know how many people i've told called that since <laughs> since you said that on my podcast and i was like man it's like a crazy way to put it but if you think about it the concept of it it is that and it's weird because yeah. it's you know I don't know. It's just a wild concept. You know, you looking back and me thinking about it, I'm like, dang, I'm so glad I'm like so far away from that. Mm-hmm. And like, even me and my guys and my crew, I told you about like, we're like all against that. We're like, y'all don't be watching porn, <laughs> you know, because it, it messes with the energy of our group too. Exactly. It really does. You know, it really exactly. does. how are we going to set the example to be the best men we can be if one of us is participating in that? Right. A lot of people may not agree and see it as innocent, but I don't. So. Anyways, I got off on this whole tangent. No, that's that's good. <laughs> Excuse my definition of that, you know, trying to, trying to be appropriate with the lady I present, but I understand. <laughs> but it, you know, I got to keep it real too. When you involve yourself in things like that, you know, um, it prevents you from being uh, connected to somebody on a deep level. Yeah. And for a lot of men, that's scary. Yeah. For a woman to know you on that deep of a level, and. That when you indulged in pornography, it's that it, it prevents that. Yeah, it stops growth. And I think it's there's two sides to it in a way because a lot of women won't allow their men to be vulnerable either. I you know, agree. they they also push that away, so it's hard for a lot of men. I had because I had a female talk to me about this recently. She was like, a, she's like a lot of women don't the the. The men do negative stuff, and it's like, yeah, you make your own choices, but at the same time, you push someone away enough, they're going to create negative habits, right? Like, I was in a relationship that I tried to be vulnerable at one point, and we're laying there, and I just started crying. I was like, I'm going through all this stuff in my head, and I remember just getting looked at like I was ridiculous, and mm-hmm. then 
complete they completely looked away. I mean, it, it broke my heart. I was like, dang, I can't even open up to this person. That's interesting. You know, and then yeah, I was watching porn and stuff because I was like, I don't even want to be around them, you know, and and not saying that's just that's totally separate from y'all situation. You know, I don't know the ins and outs, but you know, that was like it did push me away to like have to escape in that way. Mm -hmm. You know? And then it, it seems to be a common thing. A lot of guys are like, you're supposed to be the man. You can't get upset. But, like, my my wife knows I'm 100% capable of protecting her, and she has mm -hmm. no doubts about that. You know, but I've, I've broken down in front of her several times because I've had to work on some stuff, and she wants to hear me, and she wants to be there for me. And I think there's a lot of power in that. Mm -hmm. You know, but unfortunately, people stray away from it. Yeah. Well, you know, it's 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 interesting concept because I know that when we started down this trail and Rick would try to share – and I would get so mad, and um, it does. It causes a block. It prevents him from sharing anymore. It's yeah. like, ooh, this is not a safe place to do this. Yeah. And it took a while for me to learn that um, he's sharing a part of his heart. Mm. And how am I responding? You know, am I going to be that safe place? And, um, you know, we, we tend as women to take it very personally that our – partner is looking or having relationships with somebody they shouldn't be what's wrong with me yeah and it has nothing to do with that yeah nothing and I think that's the one thing that really was that hurdle once I got over that then I was able to say okay now I see this has nothing to do with me there's something there's issues going on that he's trying to overcome yeah and I'm I going to be a part of that problem and my problem of lashing out at him and being angry and withholding emotional support um, was a detriment to where he wanted to go emotionally and spiritually. And it just maybe took things down a little darker yeah. path. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it, you know, pushes him away. So take a, take us along that. Like, when did you start recognizing these, these habits or whatever? Um, um, we had, uh, well, of course, we did a life and career management course. I wanted to become a, a realtor. Okay. And um, the course that we took was quantum physics. It was it was called life and career management, yeah, right? Quantum management. Um, and we learned uh, through that process what commitment looks like. Mm -hmm. And I realized I wasn't being very committed by the results I was getting in my relationship. And so I had Rick join the next round of uh, classes, and, and that really helped put our mindset to what are we committed to in this relationship. Okay. And so that was the first part. It's, it was such a long you know, time in doing this, and this was before we had kids. Michael wasn't born yet. Um, we ended up having getting pregnant with Michael during that time because I think we had both just let our guard – guards down that we mm -hmm. were able to conceive yeah. we were married almost five years by the time we had michael mm. um and there was a lot of stuff you know leading up to going on with that um with the cheating and things yeah. but um still after having two boys it still didn't rectify there was a lot of things that were going on and that's when we ended up finding our mentor uh kevin and debbie Okay. And, and this was like way down the road. Yes. We were yeah, already from, <clears throat> 10, years 10 years into in. it. 10 years in. And I was ready to walk out. I was I was done. At that point, that's when I started nursing. I was, went to school for oh, nursing. Because okay. I thought, this isn't going to end well. And I was a stay-at-home mom. You set yourself up. And I needed to get myself taken care of, mm. you know, for my boys and myself. I didn't want to be in poverty. And depending on alimony and child support, because I've seen how that works. Yeah. Um, so I started going to school little by little, which is probably a good thing that it took me a long time to finish school because during that time we were still trying to fix still growing, yet, still growing. I just, I, I think it's, I find it so fascinating that the length of which y'all worked on things, mm -hmm. you know, it wasn't overnight. <laughs> well, that's, that's, and I think that's something to focus on for a moment is, you know, people give up so quickly nowadays, Very. so quickly. I, you know, they've been married two years, five years. I'm thinking, oh, you guys have just started. Yeah. Just started. You know, it's like, hmm. I, I feel badly for them. Yeah. Because of the benefit of working it out, because it can be worked out. And I'm not talking about abusive relationships or things like that where you know you're physically in harm. But um, when you come across these emotional 
things if they can be worked on. Yeah, and and that's where I think you can give a lot of value because I you know I had a lady comment on YouTube somewhere like about him kind of talking about what he was doing and uh, on the clip, and she was like, I would I can't I can't believe I got led to this clip and this guy. I was in a relationship where they were hooked on porn and da, 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 da. she was just blasting it. I was like, watch the full episode. Like, you learned learn something from this. <laughs> it's not about like what he did and that like, right. And people just assume, you know, cause unfortunately a lot of people watch a 60, sec- 60 second clip and they want the full context. Right. <laughs> and it's like, no, this is a preview for the whole episode. I hate trying to be, but people don't want to watch stuff for an hour and a half sometimes. And that's, that's on them. But if you actually listen and understand the whole story, you may be able to like shift your mindset a little bit. you, are obviously very upset and rightfully so, mm-hmm. but there's more to it and that you could probably gain some value from, you know, and I think it comes down to your just, I mean, we talked about it several times, just your patience and your faith in, in God and him in order to like see it through. I think it's such a beautiful thing because like I, I see things crumble so quickly nowadays well, was, with people for the, the, the smallest things. Yeah. It was definitely, um, uh, Something for me to learn in, because I I did not have patience. I had to learn that. Oh, oh yeah. I had to learn forgiveness because I did not. I was not a very forgiving person. Dang. It was something that I had to learn through this process, and and apologize, and learn to give forgiveness, and um, that was one of the things what uh, Debbie had taught me. Okay. Um, that was I think the major turning point for me because. Instead of looking at myself as the victim of what was going on, she turned the focus on me. Mm. Okay, so here I'm complaining about him. And she said, well, what is the truth? She would always ask me that. What is the truth? She said, does he always do that? Is he never doing something? And I was like, huh. Well, no. You know, because sometimes he was very affectionate. He was always a good dad. Yeah. Um, he always put his kids first. Um, and there were times that he did not follow through in his commitment and what was going on. Yeah. And so every time I would have uh, negative thoughts, the negative feedback loop coming through that eventually will lead you to divorce Yeah. about my husband. You know, he never is this. He's always this. He's you know, always cheating on me. He's never home. You know, he's never emotionally available, whatever it is. I'd have to stop and ask myself, is that the truth? Yeah. And I had to think, okay, when were the times that he has been emotionally available? When has he not cheated? Yeah. When has he? And that's when I started making that change. Instead of looking at the always, the never, you should have, you could have, I had to change my mindset that way interesting so you're not like you're kind of observing it you're not you're not necessarily like blaming yourself for his actions but you're like well but why are these actions coming you know coming to be right like how can I improve the situation you know Mm -hmm. and like focus on that like okay yeah where it stems from more so I think it's very interesting and um what do you think you know leading up to like these conversations with Debbie that's her name, right? Um, what did hold, ma- help make you hold on throughout this time frame, you know, up until then, right? And really making the big shifts um, in y'all's relationship. You know, was it just, was it the kids or, you know, did you do something inside of you to, you know, I know things can be better or what What was it you think? Well, I, I wanted to have a family. I wanted to be able to have, you know, where mom and dad are functioning in a, a nuclear home. Yes. And that was really important to me only because, you know, I had so much chaos growing up and I didn't want that in our home. And even though we were creating <laughs> that at home, um, I wanted to be able to be that example to our kids to show them how we can overcome. Mm. This is how we can do it. Yeah. And even though the boys didn't know what was happening with their dad, yeah. they just thought their mom was off their freaking rocker because I was angry Mm. all the time you know it's just it was really hard so um once we finally kind of got over that hump then I had to go back and also repair with my children Mm. you know 
Victoria didn't get the brunt of that because by the time she was born, we had already resolved, you know, a lot of that. And so she grew up in a totally different home. Yeah. Whereas my boys witnessed a lot. A lot of the growth. A lot of the growth. And they just didn't understand what was happening. Yeah. And they could, you know, and they could feel that. Oh, they feel it. They saw it. You know, so it was it was hard. Um, I'm thankful that I was able to talk with Mike before I lost him. Yeah. And, um, you know, that he he just, Mom, you did a great job. Yeah. You know, I, I love you. I understand. You know, th- there's no need to apologize. That's good. So I, that's I good. do appreciate that. Yeah, of course. I mean, that's um, that's a lot. There's a lot to a lot to hold on to. Mm-hmm. But you did. I mean, it's obviously benefited, you know, looking yeah. at y'all now. Right. Well, it's hard. You know, it's hard to overcome any type of addiction when you're in a marriage. And when you throw sexual addiction on that, it compounds it because like Kelly said, it's easy for, it's easy for you to take it personally. Yeah. And, uh, one of the toughest things that I've, I've ever had to deal with is the impact that that's, that my actions had on our family in the early years Mm -hmm. and the struggles that we had to go through because of it and the effect that it had on our, on our boys. Yeah. Um, even to this day, I mean, there's still issues that my son uh, has to navigate life through because of his childhood trauma. And fortunately, he sees a lot of that and he's able to do the work. Yeah. But the reality is that there's still a lot of trauma in the family dynamic when addiction is part of the equation. Yeah. And if we can learn to navigate through that process of loving each other unconditionally and realizing, and this is the thing that Kelly was so, so instrumental in is she was able to get to a place where she looked at me and didn't see me as the enemy. Yeah. I'm not her enemy. I was her husband. I was her uh, companion. I was her friend but I had some issues that I was dealing with psychologically with my own psychology, navigating through my own trauma. And for people who are stuck in that paradigm, um, you have a, you have a tendency to, uh, to hide. You don't want people to know. And hiding is probably the worst thing that you can do for any addiction is, isolate and the next thing you know you're by yourself and you're cut off yeah and so having kelly in my life at that point um i didn't i didn't have to isolate as much because she was there so she was constantly around so she could see what was happening and when she got over that hump of understanding that i wasn't her enemy and i wasn't doing it to her we were finally able to start moving in a positive direction and i think that's the thing i want to give your listeners hope in is that uh, you can overcome. Yeah. You can overcome this. This is not a death sentence to a marriage. It's not a death sentence to a man. It's just a sentence of learning how to navigate it in a positive way mm. so that you can reap the reward of the journey. Yeah. And that's all it is. It's a journey of going deep inside yourself to navigate some of the hurt and pain. And when you realize it from that perspective, it's hard to take it. I mean, I shouldn't say it's hard to take a person because you're still going to take it personally. I yeah. Mean, for God's sake, I was betraying our, our bow. Yeah. And so taking it personally was expected, but taking it personally and not holding it against me and using it as revenge. Yeah. You know, as some sort of, you did this to me, so I'm going to do this to you. Yeah. So this tick for tat kind of yeah. mentality. Which is even she worse. Yeah, she uh, never had that. That's good. I mean, that's that's amazing too. And I think... That's the whole thing, too, and, like, uh, you know, you can see comments maybe on YouTube or wherever, and people are like, oh, no, screw that, or, you know, I I posted some stuff, and we'll get to this about, you know, your son, and, you know, of course, people are like, I would kill everybody if someone did that to my kid, and it's like, (sighs) ignorant statements, one, the guy's in prison, two, like, like, you can learn something from this, the whole forgiveness aspect, and, like, to me, the heavy the the point is is like not holding on to resentment. 
based right. on any situation. Right. Because right. here's another thing I like to look at too, is most people's situations aren't going to be as extreme. Most people will never have to face anything like that. God forbid they do. Most people will not have to have their marriage tested the way y'all have. But y'all had to face those things. But look at y'all now and look at what you've grown. And that's the thing people need to look, think outside the box. Like, okay, one, you're probably not going to use your, lose your kid that way. You're probably not going to go through these things in your marriage to this degree for, su- for such a long time. Here's the here's a way to analyze the simpler, smaller things in your life issues and reflect on what y'all have been through and right. apply that to their life. You know what I'm saying? And it's, I, a, but, it's an individual thing. Yeah. You know, it's not him. You know, I can keep focusing on him, but what is my part in it? Mm-hmm. And that for the longest time, codependency issues always would just make me furious because, you know, you're part of the problem. But they never really tell you how. Yeah. You know, and, and that's one of the things that I learned is how I was becoming part of the problem and not being available to him emotionally. That was one thing I remember um, the scripture when it talks about um, sacrificing your life for another. And we all know, you know, husbands will throw themselves, you know, in front of a bullet. They will take mm-hmm. care of their family no matter what. Yeah. One of the biggest things that they're not willing to sacrifice is their own will within the home. So what is it going to take to improve my marriage that I need to shed off of myself? Is it my pride? Is it my stubbornness? Is it my anger? Mm. You know, all of those things are part of addiction. Yeah. And so you know without a shadow of a doubt that you'd give anything for your wife, your children, yeah. put your life in the line of fire. But what about that emotional aspect? Mm. Are you willing to die to yourself to benefit your family? Interesting. And that's what my husband did. And it's painful. Mm. Dying in the physical sense is not easy. Yeah. I've seen it time and time again being a nurse. It is not an easy process for the person that's going through it and for the family. It's not an easy process. And it's the same thing for the spiritual, the mental aspect of that. You are rebuffing yourself. You're rebuffing your body. You're rebuffing your soul. It takes work. Like a, like a, um, you know, they use a the term like a, a ego death pretty much. Right. Essentially, right. right? Like. On both sides. Yeah. Like willing to like almost like eliminate that part of your ego and. Basically kill that off in order to truly Benefit level out. the other person. Yeah. I mean, it takes a lot of work, you know. A lot of people do that with takes like. No greater love than yeah. a person to sacrifice themselves. Oh, yeah, without a doubt. I mean, I think self-sacrifice is like, you know, mm-hmm. for others is the highest honor <laughs> there is, to be honest. So I think that's a, that's a really good point. And he was willing to do that after mm-hmm. given time. Yeah. And when you when, taking what she said from a scriptural point of view, one of the things that marriages become, this is, this is the purpose, according to our scripture, as to why people get married, because it represents the love that Christ has for his church. So if we've got this representation of Christ and the church being his bride, and my marriage, our marriage becomes a representation of that bond, mm-hmm. then... As a husband, I need to be able to be as Christ is to his church, and that is giving. Yeah. But when you're hurt and you're in pain and you're suffering, it's hard to give from a depleted cup. Without a doubt. And that is where marriages thrive. We all get depleted of our cup, but we all have the opportunity to fill each other's cup up on a daily basis. Yeah. And so how we navigate that and fill each other's cup becomes the instrument by which the world sees the love of God and his people. Yeah. And I have found it to be the case, has been my experience, that those of us who have a professing faith in Christ, in God, our marriages, that one instrument to show the love of God, 
we fail at the same rate of people who have no relationship with God. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. And my question was, how is that possible? How is it, Rick, that you you have the spiritual mindset, you've been brought up to believe spiritual principles, but yet at the same time, you're so hurting and so empty on the inside that you're willing to do this to your own wife. Something's got to be wrong. So I'm not condemning anybody. I'm just saying that there's something wrong with the system. Yeah. You know, our system was broke. And the reason it's broke is because our ego wants to protect us from any humiliation. It wants to protect us from that pain and that suffering that could be caused by your indiscretions. And so you pull away and you start to hide from it when in the real when reality that's the worst thing you can do is you got to get it out. You got to speak to somebody about it. You got to have some help. You got to get a coach. You got to have a mentor. You've got to have somebody that can help you navigate some of those issues that's <clears throat> going on in your life. And fortunately for us, we had that through Kevin and Debbie, our, our mentors that were able to give us that, that shining light of exposure, but in a loving way, yeah. not a condemning way, not a judgmental way, not in a crucifixial way, but, just in a loving fashion to say, although your behavior isn't necessarily a normal behavior, the thought process you're going through is very normal for people who are hurting. So here's how we're going to get around it. Yeah, and you and you look at that ego as like, you know, you're giving up your strongest part of yourself in a way because, that you know, your ego kind of, in a way, it centers you, right? You're like, this is who I am. I, I think of it, you know, in a spiritual sense of the God tier. And so the God tier was the, the mightiest warrior of all the gods. And uh, there's uh, Fenrir, the, the world eater. It's this giant wolf that basically is destined to, like, just consume the earth, right? And uh, Tyr, knowing he was the strongest warrior, sacrifices a uh, fighting hand to the God, uh, to Fenrir. Tyr sacrifices fighting arm to Fenrir in order to keep balance. So he was willing to allow this wolf to bite his hand off the strongest part of himself, everything he was known for, for humanity, for everything, in order to keep peace and keep it from going into destruction. And so that's like kind of my kind connection, of something I think I, I love that sacrifice, <laughs> like willing to give the best, you know, that piece of yourself up <clears throat> for the greater good. And I think that comes down to the simple, the same thing too, right, is like eliminating that ego for the betterment of your family and your marriage and everything. And that's the whole story of Jesus Christ. Yep. Rick had told me I was, I was pregnant with Victoria by this time that I found out everything. Oh yeah. Everything. Yeah, and about uh, that. I, I honestly thought I could handle it, that we were at the point in our <laughs> relationship that it would be okay. Um, but after, and this is my ego, you know, after he went to work and thinking about it, I took it personally. Again, mm. what's wrong with me? You know, how come I'm not desirable? You know, all the things that, you know, came from the past, you know, well back in. Yeah, and, and this is after he's already made, like, you know, the changes. He's shown the commitment. He mm -hmm. just had held, held on to those. Take, right. Wanted to take that stuff to the grave. Right. Yeah. Right. So, in him, and I am, I'm thankful that he did tell me because it, it did take our relationship to a completely different level. Yeah. You know, than wh where we are now. He had said that it had taken a toll on you, though. Like it did. You were, you were, I mean, you were, you were like, do I want to have the baby and whatnot? Yes. Yeah. I mean, it was. Because I just thought, this is the same old stuff. Am I really going to continue with this? Mm. You know, and um, I really had to put it in perspective. I really had to. Again, is it the always, the never, yeah, you know, aspect of it? Of course. And I had to look back and say, okay, this is not the truth. And you, you do a lot of self-reflection. Mm -hmm. You know, how, how are you going to forgive and move forward? Because this happened in the past. You know, he's coming clean, and this, doesn't, this isn't where we are now. Yeah. And so it, it did take some time. And, and however, even with all that, and um, continue on and having our, our daughter, um, he still had a track record that he had to be accountable to. Yeah. So he can't just go missing in action. Yeah. And if he was going on a job, you know, he had to let me know when he got there, when he left. You know, he sent pictures. And it wasn't anything that I had asked for. 
It was how he was showing how to take care of my heart and making me feel safe in the relationship. Yeah. You know, because it wasn't like, oh, you better text me. when You, you better send me, you know, I want to talk to it. No, he always managed to look after um, and rebuilding that trust. Yeah, of course. It, it did. It took a long time. 10 years. Yeah, I remember you saying that a whole decade. Yeah. yeah, so 10 years of screwing everything up and then another 10 years of, of repairing it. And, you know, it's interesting because, uh, you know, you have people get in these situations in their relationship early on and, uh, you know, they have to rebuild the trust and they get impatient that they're not trusted within a month. Right. You know, right. I says that says a lot about you guys. I mean, one, you, you know, just being able to forgive, but two, you being able to like push and work at it and, and be like, I can, I can gain her trust back for that long of time. You didn't give up. You're like, oh, she's never going to trust me again. Cause right. most people will be like, oh, they're not yeah. going to trust me. That's easy to do. It's easy to just throw in the towel and quit and say, I mean, you know what? I'm, I, I, I might as well just start fresh with something new. And up until y'all, like, I, I mean, I think that's kind of like, was my mindset. I mean, you know, you think about these, you don't hear about these, you know, stories of growth like that and so it's easy to think like i mean I, hell i could never trust anybody again or they would never you know trust me again <laughs> you know like there's there's no way yeah this always sticks with you but to hear y'all like no this is actually and you can you're you can actually able to leave the relationship but you're going to take that baggage with you you're going to do it all over again like the girl that is commented it? on the youtube mm-hmm. yeah she's just mad and i get yeah. it but and yeah. you you bring it into the next relationship and not trusting that person, even though they didn't have anything to do with it. Oh yeah, and that that's that's uh that's important too. I mean, uh, Lydia and I had talked about that because a lot of people will hold someone's past prior to them against them, right? And it's like, wait, you weren't even a part of my life, right? Like you've been given me a shot to change, you know. And like Lydia said since day one, like I, why do I care about anything from your past? Like that's not who you are anymore, right? It's exactly it's who you are tomorrow that matters you know, or now, but you know, every step forward that you try to be better and better and better and always improve. But yeah, I've got a, you know, not the best past, you know, but I guess what I've learned from all those things, Mm -hmm. but you're willing to even these things happen within your marriage and that you're able to forgive that and move forward from that in a positive way is uh, powerful. Yeah. Well, you know, when you think about all these experiences that you have in life, and you talk about relationships and the experiences you have in the relationship, it's, it's normal. It's, 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 it's part of life for these experiences to happen to you. And then you, you, you create in your mind um, a belief system about what just happened to you. Yeah. And so when you have this belief system that he's always going to cheat, he's never going to change Um, she's always going to be mad. She's never going to change. And you break that off before having the ability to work through it. Then you take that experience of failure and you take it right into the next relationship and you go, well, that guy always did this, this, and this. So I'm sure this guy's going to always do this, this, and this as well. Or she always did that, that, and that. And I'm sure this one's going to do that, that, and that. And so we just constantly compare our experiences, our bad negative experiences to everything in life. And therein lies the problem and why we're such a divided group of people today, not just in our relationships and marriages, but just the, across the board, we, we've justified our belief systems at such a level that now we cut people off and say, we don't want to have anything to do with you, even though we don't know you. Yeah. Because just because we know we've had an experience of somebody that looked like you, the past and the his (laughs) in history. Yeah. They're like, Oh, people don't change. People don't change, but it's just, you know, I like to, uh, you know, giving y'all our, uh, follow Christ. I look at it this way too. It's like people always want to talk about that. That our believers want to talk about. Well, I need to walk like Christ. Well, he he was able to like he was thrown in tombs and he people did this and that and they like constantly condemned him. He didn't hold the past against him. He's like, you know what? I'm going to sacrifice myself for y'all. Essentially, right? Like I'm going to die for y'all. Father, like he was him. willing to do pay the ultimate price right. for people that hated him, right? And he didn't. He wasn't considering the past, like, oh no, I ain't doing this, y'all. Like, mm-hmm. y'all been jacking me up. Yeah. No, he was actually like, hey, I'm gonna like show y'all that true love. 
you know, and then we look at, you know, essentially, I mean, these are big things within our lives, but even, even smaller things. And we are not willing to move forward with somebody based off of those, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so I don't know. That's just kind of like the way and, I like the. And when you bring, you bring up Jesus as to, as, as his example, husbands have Jesus as the example of what servant leadership looks in the home. So what are you willing to sacrifice for the betterment of your wife? Yeah. How far will you be willing to go to crucify your ego? Yeah. And the same thing with the wife, you know, how far are you going to go to crucify your ego so that you can make this marriage work so that you become a representation of what unconditional love looks like. And that's what marriage is about. It marriage is the weight room for learning how to love unconditionally. Yeah. And when you move away from that arena, then it's easy to quit on unconditional love. Yeah. You just give up and say, well, you know, no one's ever going to be deserving of it. You know, no one could ever do it. No yeah. one's ever going to be you know, good enough. Yeah. Uh, and for me, that's where I see the biggest hurdle in our lives today yeah. is we've become so accustomed to just cutting and running. In the fire service, we get into a, a situation where we have a, a major fire going on, a wildland, and if you get yourself in a bad spot, you don't even have time to pick up your hoses. You just got to cut and run. Yeah. And that's what relationships have become. They become this big fire exposure where everybody just cuts and runs instead of figuring out, okay, how can we better this relationship and grow in it and let it be happening for our benefit, for our learning, for our growing into becoming more like him, more like God, more yeah. like Christ. And when we can start to navigate our relationships that way, a lot of the stuff just rolls off your back. Mm -hmm. You realize that you've got a bigger purpose. This isn't not this, this relationship isn't about me. Yeah. It's about the serving of the need of another person at a level that is divine. Yeah. And I mean, that's, I mean, that's perfectly said, you know, and, you know, I think about people today, you, along with what you said, that all these divisions are like these big hurdles is the ego thing again. Everybody thinks like, oh, well, these people, I don't know, you got to earn my trust. You got to earn my trust. And I'm like, since when do we hold ourselves to such a degree that like everybody's got to earn our trust that doesn't even know us? Like I believe in, you know, I'm, I'm human, you're human. I trust you until you burn me. And then you got to earn my trust back if you want it, right? Right. Or we just got it off, right? But, like, why can't we just be trusting? Because you get people that are like, oh, you're just too trusting of people. And I'm like, well, yeah, but, it, like, I look at the strong relations that I have from, from being that way. And those are forever a part of my life. Sure, I've been burned, but I've only learned from those people. Like, thank you for teaching me a lesson, you know. Uh, but who are we to be like, oh, I got to everybody's got to earn my trust. Like, like you're some King. You know what I'm saying? It's a pretty narcissistic approach to life. Isn't yeah. It? But that's a, that's a, such a common way yeah, of thinking. It's, and it's a, like, no, that's, I don't think that's the way it should be at all. Like you trust somebody until it's burned and then you earn it back. Like with you guys. Right. Yeah. Because if you, if you go into a, a relationship untrusting from the get go, <laughs> Well, then that's that's going to cause a massive roadblock there because yes. <laughs> you're going to have a wall up. <laughs> the foundation of every relationship is trust. And once that trust is violated, you've got two options. You can cut and run from that and start over because it's going to be hard work. Or you can just pour everything you've got into rebuilding that foundation. Exactly. And once you rebuild that foundation in a relationship that's already broken because of a trust factor, mm -hmm. that trust becomes so deep and it becomes such a well that once you've walked through that, you don't want to ever violate it again. Exactly. And I think too many people have never gone through that journey of walking through rebuilding trust. Mm -hmm. So therefore they don't know what they're losing or yeah. what they're missing out on because it's just so normal to just let's just cut, run, start over, cut, run, start over. Well, what kind of legacy are you going to leave your family when cutting and running in a relationship becomes as normal as breathing. Mm. That's where we are today in our society. We've got so many marriages that are, and I, and you know, and, and I understand why we're hurt. Yeah. And that pain and that suffering uh, 
just seems a little easier just to remove that and almost like have a surgical removal, and then I can start all over again. The problem is, like what Kelly said, you may start all over, but you're still bringing yourself to the next relationship. So what that tells me is that relationships are about learning how to control self. Yeah. When you can master the emotion of self, you can master the, uh, the ups and downs and go inward yeah. instead of always pointing the finger outward you start to learn how to remove the beam from your eye. And that's another spiritual principle taught in Scripture is that you remove the beam from your eye first before you can see the speck in your brother's eye. Yeah. And so beam removal is a predominant feature in every relationship that is healthy. Yeah. And until you're willing to go down that road and start looking at self and remove that beam you will continue to bring up all of that old baggage and all that old hurt in every relationship that you go into. And that is what's causing division. Yeah. You know, what's important too is um, in that beam removal process, you know how hard it is to change within yourself. Yeah. And you have more compassion and more love and more outreach to somebody else who's going through the same thing. And that's why it's so important for people to talk about what goes on. When you have an issue and you've overcome, it's so important to understand how the, how they did it Yeah. and how you got to the other side. People, a lot of times they see me and they have no idea that I have. Been through what you have. Yeah, that yeah. we survived sexual addiction and that we've lost our son. We've been in through financial perils. I mean, they have no idea. Your husband's they, been paralyzed. My husband's been paralyzed. <laughs> and that, that was another, you know, yeah. hard one to overcome. Yeah. You know, we're, we're still working on that. You know, so it's, uh, but it's important for people to talk about those things. It's not shameful. It's something that um, if we taught each other, mm-hmm. you know, how to manage that. But I think even in my own self, and all the things that I've had to relearn, um, I've learned to have more compassion for people, oh, especially doubt. if they're struggling. Yeah, because yeah. you see it. Yeah, you see it. You, you even though they can say, "Oh no, no, everything's great." No, no, no you can see it. Yeah, you know? I, I I agree. I even like you, you know the dark things and your your traumas. I mean, I remember I was in uh, Costa Rica, I did ayahuasca, <laughs> and this guy was like, we was like towards the end of the thing, and this guy was like, show. Uh, Show compassion towards your shadows. He's like, the shadows are always there, but mm-hmm. give them compassion. And then like, I really got to, you know, of course, I'm in that state of mind. I'm like, whoa, <laughs> you know. And, um, but I think it's just really, and in, in, with what you were saying is like, not only like working on other things, but confronting everything and feeling it actually. You know, I'm, I'm a big believer in this. I mean, for me, you know, a few years back, like I went to the woods and I did like a massive mushroom trip. I took a lot, but I knew what it was going to do. It was going to force me to go com- as far in as I could. And I did, I was crying, bawling my eyes out for probably eight hours straight. <laughs> but then I had a pack of smokes, you know, had a, jo- a couple of joints and a bottle of whiskey. And I just sat there in the woods by a fire and I just was like, Oh my gosh. And I was <laughs> Working on myself. I was laid out on the, the rocks. I mean, it was just like, it was a night. But I faced everything in my life that I've ever been through. And then some. Things that I never, like, I thought, totally thought I covered up. But I felt it all. And that was, like, one of the most powerful things I could have done. It was an extremely spiritual, uh, internal experience. But, like, I'm, I, so I'm, I'm a big, I'm not saying everybody go do that. But I think, you know, there's the amount of power that can have facing all the things that no matter how you do it, I think is just, is the key, right? Face everything, confront it and then work on it. Yep. But you need to like bring it all to surface and that's hard for people to do. Right. They don't want to feel it. It's uncomfortable. And, but it, it's only going to destroy you at the end. And I think, you know, if you get to a point in your life to where it is over and if you get to think about it, you're going to regret not working on those things for sure. Yeah. You know, yeah. cause that's just resentment and that's just stuff you carry with you. Till the end of your life. 
Yeah, that and that resentment leads to a, a, an unforgiving heart. Yeah. And when we operate in life with an unforgiving heart, uh, we build up anger, resentment, bitterness, and then that becomes our belief system. And now when we think about things and we experience the emotion of things, our belief system validates that experience and it goes right back in and you cycle back into another round of negative thinking. Yeah. And it just keeps going and going and going until somebody finally says, I've had enough. I quit. Yeah. I'm done. I need to change. I need to stop. And then you start to focus. Okay. So everything that's happening is not happening to me. So you didn't do this to me. I just have a way of interpreting my experiences with what you're doing in a way that's negative and it feeds my system of understanding my yeah. beliefs and values. So I get to be justified. Therein lies the danger. The minute you can be justified to harbor resentment, to harbor bitterness, to harbor that anger, then you've just allowed yourself to accept being miserable yeah. in your life. And you know, and the thing is, is like when you break those chains and you actually feel that stuff, the amount of liberation and freedom you feel from it. It's a relief. Is insane. Yeah. It yeah. unleashes an ent entirely different person. I like to share this story too. It goes back to the psilocybin. But um, so I do like a trip in the woods, like a, a, a yearly thing. So last year, you know, I told my wife like, hey, I got to do this thing. I just got to go do my self work. Well, you know, I go camp out and just one week in a year. It's just for me. And, uh, you know, obviously it's not that I don't want her going, but, you know, I want to be isolated in that moment. I don't want to have any distraction. I need to go fully inward. You know, in that state of mind, if anyone's around, you're just aware of that. And she's very supportive. And so it's crazy because last year I went, and it's after I'd done all this work on myself and, you know, grown with her and all these different things. And uh went to this spot. It was last February, and it was pretty cold out. And, um... I, you know, sitting on this cliff side at this place I go and uh, way out in the woods and, you know, I, you know, do eat my things, you know, and I start seeing like the trees are all like alive and I'm like, oh, this is the most beautiful thing. And then I go and it gets dark and I'm sitting by the fire and I'm like, all right, let's do some work. And I stood up and I started doing like some prayer and some chanting, some, uh, some mantras I do and whatnot. And, um, I just felt in the moment that was what I needed to do. It was probably 30 degrees out <laughs> and, uh, and then I was cold and I stood up, and I was like, man, I'm not cold. I'm not even cold. Like, what is, it's In my mind, I'm cold, but, like, I'm actually good. So I just, like, <laughs> I stripped down to my underwear, right? So I'm standing by this fire, and I'm just like, oh, I just feel so good. And then I started looking around the woods, and I was like, I can see. Like, it's not even dark. And I was like, I got night vision. <laughs> and I was like, I'm a werewolf. And then I just took off through the woods. I mean, if somebody was out there, they would have been like, what the hell is wrong with this guy? I took off through the woods, and I'm just, like, breathing. I'm just like in tune like I, I went into this wolf mindset and i went up to the cliff and i even started howling i was like just howling off the side of this cliff but the analogy there what i i didn't really turn into a werewolf but i think i just <laughs> was like holy shit i feel free i've done so much work and i just i remember uh getting by the fire and just like sobbing i was like i've done so much work on myself like i just feel this massive amount of freedom that i'm just running through the woods wild without a care like, I didn't have to do any self-work. I mean, there's always ways to work on yourself, but I realized, like, how much work I'd done myself the, the year prior. And, and by facing those things and allowing that, this was just, in that moment, I was just free from it all. And it felt good, yeah. <laughs> you know, just to go freaking running wild through the woods True. and not caring. So, yeah. I don't know. It's cool. I think it's cool to do that because it's uh, it just, I don't know, shows you the growth you have, I think, when you force yourself inward every once in a while, but I don't know. That's, <laughs> well, it's, you know, life has its ups and downs and I know that, yeah. and I always tell people, you know, when we were first married, you know, the ups were real high and the downs were very low. Also, the older we have gotten, we still have nice ups and the downs don't go down as far, mm -hmm. you know? And I think because we recognize things in each other that we're able to pick ourselves up and move forward again. Um, and I know that, just before we lost Mike, I think that was probably the happiest time of my life. The, I've never felt such exhilaration.